site. So you're probably on our free practice site. So practice.ekgguy.com. That's our full practice site that we have. So register there um, and you could start to climb our leaderboard and start getting practice. But let's go to our question to review. So here we have an ECG that was obtained from a 52 year old male smoker with untreated hypertension that presents with pneumonia. The ECG shows an irregularly irregular rhythm with three or more different P wave morphologies and an atrial rate above 100 beats per minute. And so if we look here, we could clearly see that if you were to march out these R to R intervals, they are all different, okay? So there's, this is what we call an irregularly irregular rhythm. So notice this interval here is shorter than the one that follows, okay, down the road. And the other thing we noted was take a look at the P waves that we have present here. So take a look at this P wave here, okay? The morphology of the next one that follows, all right? And if you even look uh, a little further down, okay? So imagine this one, here are some P waves. Some of them are buried within uh, the end of the T wave, but there's a P wave, okay? And if you just look at these, so take it, here's one, here's another one. And then if you look at uh, even this one here, that's a third different one, okay? Or here's one, two, three, you know, so, and, and four. So at least four more than that throughout, okay? So there are many P waves. We're looking for at least three P waves. And we mentioned that the atrial rate was fast. Okay, so let's look at the atrial rate. Well, we know that from beginning to end of our ECG, so this is a standard 12 lead ECG. This is 10 seconds. 10 seconds times six is 60 seconds, which is equal to one minute. So that's one minute. That means if we count the P waves going across, uh, multiply that by six, we can get an estimate of the atrial rate, okay? Now the atrial rate was uh, actually uh, well above 100. It was 120 beats uh, per minute. So let's look at how we get that, okay? So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All right, so you would do 20 times six, and that's 20 P waves times six is 120 beats per minute. So we have, again, some of those P waves are buried within. If you look at some of the other leads, you might be able to make them out, okay? So if you look down below in B1, that could be a helpful way to distinguish some of those that are sometimes blended in with the end of those T waves, okay? Especially with these faster rhythms, you start to narrow that R to R R to R interval. And with that said, sometimes the P waves can be uh, buried within the T wave, okay? So given that we have a rate, an atrial rate over 100 beats per minute, more than uh, three different P wave morphologies, an irregularly irregular rhythm, this should make you start thinking about multifocal atrial tachycardia, okay? And that's exactly what's present here. Now, each of these P wave uh, morphologies that we see, and many of them, originate from different ectopic atrial focus. So there's every focus is given contributing to these different P wave morphologies. Now, one tip, the first tip I want to leave you with is that the varying P wave morphologies in multifocal atrial tachycardia, okay, they, they suggest the absence of one dominant atrial pacemaker. And this actually helps you differentiate it from sinus tachycardia with frequent multifocal premature atrial complexes where you may see a dominant sinus pace, uh, pacing pacemaker that has that same morphology and then interspersed with different uh, premature atrial complexes, okay? The other tip that I want to leave you with is, you know, when you, you think about AFib, that's another irregularly irregular rhythm. So what's the difference? Well, clearly you have clear atrial activity in the form of P waves that is not present in uh, atrial fibrillation. But how do you differentiate this from MAT from coarse atrial fibrillation? Well, what's helpful is the baseline uh, between P waves helps to uh, identify MAT, in this case, this rhythm, uh, versus is a coarse atrial fibrillation, okay? And so you could see this baseline uh, that's occurring. We can make out clear P waves here. Here's a good example of that baseline that uh, you could see here as well, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now, um, one important thing to keep in mind is that multifocal atrial tachycardia, this rhythm, gives rise to various P, P wave morphologies. And in some cases, you could have P waves that appear as if atrial enlargement is present, okay? So now this one here, look at that P wave uh, in lead two that may 
make you think that, oh, maybe there's right atrial enlargement, all right? Or if you look at V1, and in V1, you may see, okay, here's, here's a P wave, right? And you may think that, okay, there's evidence of left atrial enlargement. However, a, the third tip I want to leave you with is do not diagnose atrial enlargement or atrial abnormality in the presence of in the absence of sinus rhythm. So those atrial enlargement should be diagnosed only if sinus rhythm is present in that. And here we don't uh, see that. Now the patient's smoking history um, and the clinical presentation of pneumonia also favor the diagnosis of MAT as it is often associated with pulmonary disease. Now, the patient is also reported to have untreated hypertension, and uh, what we see here is actually that may correspond to the large QRS voltages we see in the precordial leads. The precordial QRS complexes in their associated ST T wave changes uh, appears to suggest left ventricular hypertrophy and also secondary repolarization abnormalities. Now, the other non-voltage associated uh, findings with LVH in this ECG include the smaller absent R waves in V1 to V3. So if you look at V1, V2, V3, there's essentially no R waves present at all. So that's suggestive. That's that poor R wave, uh, poor anterior forces, poor R wave progression. The other thing is the R wave amplitude in V6 uh, is actually greater that, than that in V5. So it's hard to make out because they're merging. Here's V6. Here's the amplitude of that. And you can see that it is actually greater than that so V6 is greater than V5. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then uh, the absence of any Q wave in leads uh, 1, V5, and V6, okay? So those lateral leads. So if you look at V5 and V6, you can see that there is no Q wave present. And then the same thing um, in, in lead 1, there, there might be uh, one that's present. So V5 and V6 help uh, to reassure that uh, LVH is present. Now, there's a lot of different criteria for LVH, okay? And if you go through, you know, our list, we have labeled them all for you. Now, the one you should keep in mind, uh, there's a few because there's multiple and the sensitivities are not very good for any of them, in fact. Now, the Cornell criteria tends to be the most accurate, and so I will provide you with, with that one. So that's looking at the R wave and AVL, okay? And you take the R wave and AVL and you add that to the uh, the S wave in lead V3, okay? And so if we were to do that here, you take this R wave, so this R wave here, and then you'd add it to the S wave in V3, which is, here's V3, and you can see this S wave is all the way down here, so quite large in itself. So if you add those together, and if it is greater than 28 millimeters for males, then that would be suggestive of it. And for females, it is simply uh, greater than 20 millimeters. And in this case, we have a male smoker, so we're looking to meet that 28 millimeter cutoff uh, by using AVL, and it's clearly met in V3 alone. So LVH is present here with that Cornell criteria, the most accurate one that you should keep in mind of them. Now, there's a few other ones that are not met here. If you look at some of the limb leads, we sometimes look at lead one and um, as well as uh, AVL, and those findings here are not meeting them, okay? So we, we won't make them. In lead one, we looked for at least 14 millimeters, okay? Uh, and then in lead uh, AVL, we looked for at least 12 millimeters, all right? So again, many different criteria. The other one that we want to keep in mind, and it's often in adults that you'll see this, uh, is using that precordial voltage that we mentioned, and that's where you take the right precordial leads, you're taking the S wave and you're adding it to the left precordial leads R wave, okay? And so let me uh, just erase this here. So if we look at V1 and V2, V5 and V6, we're taking the largest one, okay? Largest S wave in the right precordial leads, which would be this one, okay, in lead V2, and then the same thing in V5 and V6, where the largest R wave uh, is this one here. And essentially, there's age cutoffs, but because we'll be dealing with mostly adults, what you're looking for is at least it being greater than 35 millimeters for those over the age of 40, which our patient here is. And so what this criteria is, is essentially you're taking the S wave in V5 or V, uh, S wave, excuse me, in V1 or V2, and you're adding that to the R wave in V5 or V6, 
Okay, and you take the largest one, and because our patient's older than 40 years of age, we want it to be greater than 35 millimeters. And it seems uh, like that's the case here, maybe in V6 alone. So we're going to use V6 here, and then we could use uh, lead V2 uh, in this case because those are the greatest. But if you look at V6 alone, imagine here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So over seven. Remember, seven times five is 35. So that alone meets the criteria and you're there. So many different criteria, I just want to keep those in mind. Now the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, there are non-voltage criteria. So left atrial enlargement is one of them. Left axis deviation uh, is another feature that you can have. Now in this case, we don't have a, a full left axis deviation uh, that would be supportive, but these are not essential. Now you can have non-specific intraventricular conduction delay. Uh, you can have a delayed intrinsicoid deflection onset such that the QRS onset to the R wave peak is more than 50 milliseconds. Uh, you could have a small or absent R wave as we saw in V1 to V3. That's that low anterior forces. Okay, so many different findings uh, to keep in mind here. Okay, now the other thing we mentioned were the secondary repolarization abnormalities uh, that we mentioned. And so let's just see what those are. Well, know that these repolarization abnormalities that occur in the ST segment in the T wave are a result of ventricular hypertrophy. And what we tend to see is that the main QRS deflection and the ST T wave segment are discordant, meaning they're going in opposite directions. We see that here. And what's we commonly see it and most prominently in leads with the largest QRS amplitude. So this is a great example because we're able to see that. So if we look here, uh, look at lead V2, we said that had the greatest, uh, essentially the greatest depth, the S wave there that we see coming down here, and then V6, the greatest R wave. So if we look at V2, notice this is a very deep S wave and that you have some ST elevation in these upright T waves that are present, okay? So those are discordant main QRS deflections downward negative, and you have the ST segment elevated with upright uh, T waves. Now, if you look at V6, you're essentially seeing the opposite, upright R waves, very tall, essentially go up to here. And then the discordance is because you have this ST depression, that downsloping, and this is an inverted T wave. So T wave inversion, as well as ST depression. So those are findings, again, most common, most prominent in leads with the largest QRS amplitude. And so that is essentially what we want to see uh, in those leads. We're looking for ST elevation and upright T waves, okay, in the right precordial lead. So this is upright T waves. And then you're looking for ST uh, depression, and we saw the T wave inversion in those left precordial leads, okay? Now with right ventricular hypertrophy, which we don't see here, essentially you'd almost see the opposite. So you'd see uh, ST depression, T wave inversion in the right precordial leads opposite of what you have here, okay? So the uh, fourth tip that I, I wanna leave you with is that there you're gonna notice that there could be this appearance of a pseudo-infarct pattern that results from left ventricular hypertrophy. And notice the QS complexes in the poor R wave progression that we see in leads V1 to V3, okay? Uh, and this is associated also with the ST elevation in the upright T waves that we said come from repolarization abnormalities. And as a result, if you didn't know that there are a, a part of that, you could then diagnose anteroceptal MI uh, and think that's what's present, right? But in this case, that was not the case. And the most likely the findings that we see here are a result of the hypertrophy left ventricle, okay? So that's again, notice there's absence of any significant normal R wave progression. And you also have some elevation uh, in these leads that we mentioned. And so if you have essentially thinking of Q waves, ST elevation, you may think that the patient has an acute anteroceptal MI. Um, and so be cautious of that. Clinical context will be the most important, okay? Uh, and so just to highlight that, so while the presence of ST segment depression, if you look at those lateral leads, uh, is one millimeter or greater in leads one, V5 and V6, the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy uh, could could be suggestive of ischemic changes, okay? And we chose not to diagnose any ischemic STT changes, especially in V6. Notice there's the ST depression uh, that's occurring, maybe slightly in V5, and that's because the LVH, the voltages are so great, and given the clinical context, it seemed like 
the hypertrophied left ventricle was most contributory to this. Okay, so in conclusion, what we had for the final interpretation was you had the multifocal atrial tachycardia as the main underlying rhythm, okay, the patient with lung disease. You have left ventricular hypertrophy that we saw in many different criteria. Uh, the precordial leads alone, we talked about the Cornell criteria that is the most accurate, and keep in mind. And then we talked about uh, hypertrophy, okay, and specifically the STT abnormalities uh, that result uh, from that, okay? So that's the main thing, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Think about that in a patient with lung disease, left ventricular hypertrophy. We have a patient with untreated hypertension. Who knows what else is going on? And then we see the hypertrophy uh, STT abnormalities as a result of that. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something.